tell us in the comment. Don't forget to hit the like button and share this video with everyone you know. Evening, everyone. As uh, we end the first month of uh, 2021, uh, let's digress a bit from our elementary uh, Feng Shui uh, modules and delve with a special topic of interest uh, tonight. Uh, that is uh, heritage uh, conservation and uh, insights into uh, green living lifestyles. So the fun adventure tonight in terms of uh, point of view of interest on how we harness luck from our uh, environment uh, comes from what uh, Jose Rizal, uh, uh, our national hero in the Philippines, uh, uh, told us before that uh, ang hindi marunong lumingon sa pinanggalingan, hindi makakarating sa paroroonan. It applies to our uh, luck seeking and harnessing behavior too in relation to our environment, especially our homes and uh, uh, building properties. No? So tonight, we take a look uh, guided by an expert in the field uh, on how uh, certain um, home and building uh, structures serve a function and also um, uh, contribute to the improvement of the quality of our human lives. So uh, let's welcome for tonight our uh, uh, homegrown uh, professional expert when it comes to this uh, architect Joy Martinez Onozawa, a good friend and uh, eventually also client of mine, but actually like my sister, she, she was an office mate when we were together in uh, National Development uh, Corporation as senior project evaluators before. Uh, so uh, let's call in uh, Joy uh, on board. Welcome, Hi. Joy. Hi. Uh, Thank you, Alvik. Thank you, Master. Okay. Uh -huh. So tonight, Joy, uh, let's take uh, our class, uh, your classmates, and my classmates too. All those, all those watching uh, globally uh, from the Philippines and uh, other countries at the moment, no? uh, on a visual storytelling about your special topic of uh, interest discussion tonight. No? So let's start with uh, uh, how you got involved in this. Uh, of course, aside from your being an architect, no? uh, can you share with us a brief introduction? How I started into being uh, practicing heritage conservation, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, I'm from Cebu, the oldest city in the Philippines, right? And. Uh, by sheer and my sheer environment we have so much of these old buildings and our forests our seas now we have so much heritage really where we practically grew, grew up with it no yeah. so understanding it was easy but teaching people about it was quite challenging though about heritage you're also talking about tradition you're talking about you know many of us grew up at least in our time you know, papaya, malunga, everything. Everyone grew their own food, right? Uh, no? Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and trip to the market, of course, was important. But you, you grow most of it, no? Like, that's how I grew up. We grew most of what we ate. We had chicken, cows, goats, turkey, duck, you know? And we had vegetables. And we so mostly got... Heritage yeah. that limited to architecture of our homes, but... No, 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 no. Uh, everything, everything that we inherit from uh, even our even our our sea, the seas, the oceans, you know, the mountains, the, those are our natural heritage. How so our we have surroundings in heritage. influence our civilization, you know. Correct. Yeah. Development as human beings. Okay. Yeah, like what so, you said, 
about what Jose Rizal said, Diba, we must know where we come from, right? Yeah, so heritage conservation is a management word. You know, it involves actually managing our culture, our community practices, built heritage, and natural heritage. But usually the practice of heritage conservation is not a goal. It's used as a tool for something else. Like it could be a tool for revitalization. It's a tool for community building, no? And it's a very, very important tool actually in also making us keep our identity and be proud of our identity as Filipinos no? when, we, when we manage our heritage resources. And this is why you find um, experts uh, conserving them through um, renovation, restoration, all of those, those, that's heritage conservation. And green architecture involves designing with culture, climate, and the environment in mind also, and you harness local people's skills and local materials. Green architecture is actually designing spaces for a lifestyle. And now, in my past, through the past years in my practice, I've all I've seen a strong synergy between heritage conservation and green architecture in the sense that a lot of what we are doing now were already practiced by our forefathers in the past so what i was trying to do is bring them out from the past and try to to teach a lot of contemporary architects with this principle so that they can come up with that okay so uh very relevant now especially in uh, pandemic times no? the positive angle that uh, this pandemic uh, can uh, offer us and our communities and our mindset could be it affords us the luxury of time to look back to their heritage and even in our own uh, small way the least we can do is uh, preserve certain uh, uh, learnings from the past that are very relevant to our survival skills as human beings yes. um, <laughs> now I, I've, I've tried to think about what's common between the two no so both utilize our local resources both are involved with conservation of our practices and especially our local materials, no? The process of conservation also involves ancient old practices that do not use present-day man-made conveniences. And this is what green architecture is also going into, trying to change whatever is are the present conveniences that are harmful and going back to how it was before. And But most importantly in my practice, both of heritage conservation and green architecture actually improves the quality of lives of people when it's managed well. Uh, it seems like a common theme uh, from my experience, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, this is where us humans can work with nature, not against it, and uh, build a better life. So like most century old churches in the Philippines, they were built with endemic stones. So for example, in Cebu, we are full of lime here. In the north, you have lots of adobe, no? Um, elsewhere it would be different, but let me speak about Cebu because I'm, this is where I live and this, where the, there's a lot of lime here. Egg whites and molasses were used as hardeners, no? And um, we used then, I mean our forefathers then used a lot of natural cement, not engineered cement, no? Mm -hmm. They would put all those rocks, the lime rocks in furnaces and really burn them to a high degree and then pour water over them and then keep them underwater for so many months, keeping on mixing them and they, they to store them for future use. And that's how mortar is being made. And they used a lot in the 1600s, uh -huh. yeah, 1700s, mostly in the 1700s. So um, are you telling us, Joy, that this uh, influence of, let's say, uh, like the way the priors built churches, yeah. like especially yeah. popular in Cebu, uh, countrysides and cities, uh, these were shared with us, the technology of this uh, from the Spanish? Yeah, Spanish and the Mexicans, I guess, also, because we find these practices in Mexico. And, you know, there was a, a base, I think, of the Spanish and at that time when we were their colony was in Mexico. Right, so and this could have been an offshoot of the Galleon trade, right? Maybe, yeah, but definitely the Spanish are also involved between the uh, Philippines and Mexico. Yeah. So, an interesting footnote here later, uh, you will learn uh, the vernacular or parochial method of uh, uh, like how Joy can even prepare uh, 
similar to the olden days uh, how to prepare your own cement right <laughs> you you have yeah. a, a slide uh, yeah. i did that a lot that. yes uh-huh. okay so let's go to the next slide well this is about the this is about the how how you call the present day bioclimatic architecture no oh. where we live in a how do you call our ecosystem subtropical forest right and it's very very humid here and this is why a lot of these buildings is raised from the um the ground and those that are not raised from the ground and they're covered you will find little holes where still the water comes i mean the air comes in and into the floors just like this uh-huh. this um house on the on the left and then we always exit the hot i mean hot air is very very light the molecules are moving so fast and they're so light and this vent on top they they let the hot air exit so that it keeps the temperature below cool no and then so you see the vent the, the the science behind this is like physics uh the low speed exceeds and the flow yeah, no? this, so physics, the, normally this, this is the vent comes, uh-oh, hot air comes yeah. from the ground and goes up to the roofing correct But if it stays there and it has no place to exit, you will see watermarks in your ceilings. You see, oh. because they have because they will condense at night, okay. and they condense into water. So that's bad. So you really need to let them out. And it can weak. It can also weaken the structure of the house. Right? Right. Uh, and ugly also, no? Dirty it makes it look so dirty, and it will get moldy, and then you have to change. So the idea of building in our environment is really to let the air circulate. And look at these heritage structures. They're te- they're teaching us a lot. You know, I, the, I, where I am in the practice of heritage conservation. I'd like to bring it to the present, to the architects at the moment and the contemporary architects to teach them the lessons of the past. And that's also one way of keeping our heritage. The building on the left. I took this picture. This is a building in Granada, in Spain, which I saw that they they really did it well. It was facing west, but however, you see, it's angled. So the sun hits the the room directly. It bends it through the operable louvers. At the same time, the louvers below just invite a lot of breeze inside. Uh-huh. Let me yeah, so share with all- you. Uh, that's a vital lesson in Feng Shui. If your house is uh, facing afternoon sun, or as you mentioned, west, no, it's very hot in the afternoon. So, uh, one learning there, a classic model, especially if you're into a commercial building, no, uh, as much as possible, don't let it face west, no, or don't choose a site that's facing west, because your your commercial endeavor will be losing money uh, in many different ways. First, because of the humidity, very hot. Customers wouldn't like to enter. A classic model here was uh, you pass by Taft Avenue, the Philippine Women's University. Uh, they tried to convert it the front to maximize uh, asset management. They converted it into a strip mall, no, uh, where you can have uh, coffee shops or ano. Uh, but to no avail, uh, it did not click because of the hardness of the place. Uh, it turned ugly even that when you passed by a university, all the windows were uh, blackened with green paint, no, to uh, to insulate the building. So that's something about West, no. Well, of course, uh, I have a classmate. Uh, I think he's also your friend. He's also a green advocate. Uh, I think he's also listening now. Architect uh, Skibo Guerrero, no. Uh, wow. In one of our Um, I happened to listen to his other green architecture lecture in one of the senior classes in uh, uh, UP School of Architecture. Uh, he mentioned that uh, uh, West is advisably, from an architectural viewpoint, it's best to have a solid wall there to insulate the building rather than put windows. You know? But as you see here, Uh, in the olden times, when they put windows, they put these uh, awnings and uh, other ventilators to uh, 
augment the cooling of the place. All the while before, uh, we we most of us grow up with the notion that these canopies, these awnings, are not really for uh, shading from the sun, the heat of the sun, but more for the rain, right? Uh, so, hindi umaangge uh, when uh, the rainy season comes, no? But yung pala, it's more for the tropical heat. This right. is where the factor exists, yes. Mm-hmm. But and they the also don't... Is, uh, typical warehouse, ano? Yung, uh, yeah, I have that in my house right here on top of my bedroom. Yeah, it works. Because the hot air will just push that or to turn around. It's like uh, self-propelling, right? <laughs> yeah, it's the hot air. Because the molecules move very fast when the air is very hot. So the warmer it is, the faster it even moves. So let's go next slide. Oh. This is one of my favorites. You know, we have, everyone is familiar with this antique whatever cabinets, and if you notice, they're all on peg. No, they don't have baseboards. Now, then, but but Ben, but then when I see many houses here, when they build them, they have so they have baseboards. You know, oh. when you do that a tropical country it gets very wet there so it has it's a haven for nesting for maggots for cockroaches to lay their eggs there because the r- wood will rot oh. yeah it can affect human health, health, no? only good for countries that are dry but it is not advisable for us here we're too humid so i would suggest that um this be raised you just raise it like kitchens like this in the picture for example it's also easy to clean under and one advantage of this is that, for example, the lower shelf, the lowest shelf of these um, cabinets that are raised above the ground, you can cut a hole, put a mesh, mm-hmm. even the cool air can go inside the cabinet, thus cooling everything inside. So there's always air circulation. So, so it you doesn't, have... breed, doesn't breed the mildew or mold? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So we so should we follow the... See, uh, the differences in terms of furniture design also uh, this is just from uh, inside right now no uh, well mahilig ngayon maraming japanese surplus no so compared to the japanese furniture design because their country is relatively cold and dry they have no footings in cabinets like this no uh there is a tatami mat or on the floor uh unlike uh Tropical countries designed like this, uh, they allow for uh, uh, good ventilation also. Before you do the regulation and layout, you should lay out the stove position in the right feng shui direction relative to the feng shui of the owner first. Before you do where you put the sink and where you put the rest. Important to put your cooking appliances in the right place. Okay, And that varies. For every individual difference based on your uh, uh, feng shui lucky directions. Okay, so let's proceed to the next slide. Oh, uh, this is all about uh, what topic, Joy? This is about um, collecting your uh, rainwater. No, it's always good to harvest your rainwater and then the overflow. Um, avoid throwing all your water into the drainage pipes, you know, those big culverts. Mm-hmm. Let them go back to the ground first because that is exactly where we need them. No, uh-huh. I think God created rain to fall vertically and that is supposed to go back to the ground. We need okay. that to flush our aquifers or else what will we pump up if we're not feeding the ground with water, right? So... Okay that you see is actually my house I all around the house I have that and that's two meters deep mm-hmm. of stone and wine bottles which I, I just inverted in gravel so I don't have culverts in my house I don't have drainage culverts in my house the rain just goes down mm-hmm. yeah and it cools the house it's a very cooling, uh, it has a very cooling effect because then even in summer it's cool you know, because all of this, my entire ground is... Mm-hmm. Despite the 
uh, more often than not, hot weather of Cebu, right? <laughs> yeah, trees grow. The trees grow very well. I don't even have to water them, you know. So it's again our natural heritage, no? Go and live with nature. Don't go against it. So I'm not really very much fond of putting our uh, wastewater to culverts because they end up in the sea where they do not belong. Because they carry off also all the pollution on the streets and all that. They're for killing our fish. And you know what killing our fish means? I mean, killing our waters, no? They, they kill off all this plant so much oxygen to us. So can I just so play this building- up? With this green design, you're actually building a, a very good ecosystem for your household, no? your property. Yeah, it, it, you don't need a drainage culvert. You just let them drain to the ground. That's where rain belongs. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... Without uh, problems with water. Okay. That's a nice insight there. And let's go to next slide. So this is a top view of a house where you would build these trenches about a meter away from your house. Don't build it naman too near, a, a meter away and, and build those trenches. And if there's extra, if let's say there's a very, very strong rain, then it doesn't circulate as much, then that extra will go to the culverts anyway. They're existing already on the street culverts, but don't make any inside your house. Na. And you will notice a big change. Yeah? Your house so when you say trenches, in ordinary layman's term, uh, these trenches would look like uh, drainage canals. No? Yeah, it's the picture on the previous slide. I drew a, a sample of a trench there, how you would oh. do it, the previous slide. It's about at least a meter long, two feet wide, and you just fill it up with lots of stones and gravel so that when it rains, it just goes down to the ground. I mean, do you know how deep the earth is? It's very, very deep, right? I mean, it could never... Oh. Yeah. What plant do you use to dye or stain? If you want red, red color. No. Gosh, you know what I use? I use um, rosette, uh, the hibiscus, the red hibiscus, the Jamaica flower. Ah, gumamela. gumamela. No, it's not really a gumamela. It's the hibiscus, the one that you make into juice. It's called also a Jamaica flower. It's, mm. it's, it is from the hibiscus family, but the pod is red. Uh-huh. Yes, yes. Uh-huh. But even um, Lanzones gives you red. You will be surprised. Oh. You so try which, red, what do you use? The, red stain. What do you use? Uh, the fruit Rosette. or the leaf? The peeling. Huh? The, the peeling. peeling. The, the ballot of the Lanzones. I see. Yeah. And, ros- okay. and the rosette. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So can girls also experience... Uh, with lanzones to make red lipstick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm serious. I was about to say that. Yeah, you just put beeswax and then that's lipstick already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. Uh, that's how the how, uh, like and all our positive. How, how makeup was invented. Uh, it's like we're in a archaeology. Uh, no? uh, our not only architecture but archaeology yeah. interesting <laughs> story in itself okay. yeah so a lot the lesson here is you can uh, dye or stain uh, your walls accordingly and according to joy in our backstage discussion you can experiment unlimitedly in creating your colors or mm-hmm. pantones and experiment with different uh, leaf or plant material to create the colors okay have that's fun a with tip. it yeah. that's a good tip also for artists no? if they want to uh create a uh, indigenous or unique uh, wall paintings or murals uh y- you might be able to utilize this or pottery right uh, joy mm-hmm. ceramics yeah okay so next uh slide please Oh, uh, Michael. Okay. Oh, this is... Oh, um, nice okay, go ahead, Joy. Yeah, this is what I use when I would make paints. And also if I would make cement to make them waterproof, I add tallow in them. So there's a lot of cows or carabaos here. And the fat of that you melt 
No, it comes out like this. That's you just make, this is talo. It's used extensively for waterproofing, especially when I'm painting in the exterior. Or even if you're painting in the interior, it, because we're humid, then, you know, it's like being in the exterior already. So I don't have any interior or exterior. For me, everything is exterior um, conditions because it's very humid. And to waterproof my walls and to use, we put talo in our lime solution. So oysters, after you eat, you just burn them in charcoal, you know? You like, you like you're making sugba. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. then you pour water into them, and they will break into powder. Okay. 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 So we sieve that. We sieve because the finer your oyster powder, the shinier your paint becomes. Mm. Okay. okay. It's very bad. It, it's really valued because the quality is just nice. So... It's really luxurious. So you Can mix you that with. Okay. Continue, yes, Joyce. Yeah. With water, you mix that with water, and then um, together with the hot tallow, you mix it there, right there, and then yeah. The most popular so far when I go around doing feng shui clients uh, in the comfort room, especially if there are smokers in the house and they smoke in the bathroom or toilet, yeah. they have the mother-in-law's tongue. Mother-in-law's uh, tongue, yeah, that's a very yeah. very potent, yes. very powerful. Okay. So that's a very relevant tip nowadays. And that now that uh, during pandemic, a lot of people are uh, 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 having a plant re renaissance, no? Or rediscovering the value of plants indoors. Okay, uh, not if not only for a hobby, but also for good health and anti-stress therapy. So next uh, slide, please, Michael. Okay, tell us about these interesting pictures, uh, Joy. Ah, this is how to get rid of rats, no? Oh, wow, okay. Now, yeah, when we rats say rats, don't... Let, excuse Joy, yeah? let's qualify. Yeah? When we say rats, it's not the Chinese Sojak people born under the sign of the rats, okay? It's the real pest. Uh, Daga, the yeah, the pest. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, but first of all, you know, rats are there because there's food crumbs flying around your house. So you should not be eating in your bedroom, Sana. Or you should be careful that when you're eating, food crumbs don't fall on the floor because that's what rats have a sense of smell a thousand times stronger than men. So they can really smell far. Okay. So mint is something that they do not like. So you can either plant mint around your garden or make mint oil for interiors to wipe on your on your garbage cans anywhere and the rats won't go there so what you can do is to get let's say a kilo of a kilo of mint mm -hmm. you no know, to one gallon of oil and then you heat that you heat it and then when it boils you put off the fire and let it steep there for an hour and you strain mm -hmm. it and then you have mint oil which you can use to wipe what everything you no know? and in your gardens can also you pink solvent can you aerosol? Mm -hmm. so, can what? You make it an air spray I don't. Uh, very uh, thick. It's very really thick. No, it's very thick. So I don't know if you can put alcohol and just try. Me, I just use it as wiping solutions. No, and also the madre de cacao is very very good. No, because the rats, if you notice, a lot of plantations around, they always line their plantations, their boundaries with madre de cacao. That's also because when the the, the rats are very attracted to this. Madre de cacao because it has a nice smell actually. But when they eat it, they bloat, you know, they bloat like a balloon and they pop, they actually die. Can also help. I don't consider caterpillars a pest because it's because they become a butterfly. Uh, okay. 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 So what you do if you find if you find caterpillars, take that caterpillar out and put them in an area like I have a little aquarium with I placed leaves uh -huh. and then you would put that caterpillar there so that he can continue eating and then morph into a butterfly. I, I can't kill a, a caterpillar. I mean, you know how beautiful butterflies are. Okay. So that's for the marigold anti-pest uh, uh, control. And now when you mentioned butterfly, uh, I learned from my experience in Feng Shui, there's a popular plant to attract butterflies in your garden all year round. And that's the lantana. Yeah. Can you share with us the other pictures of Lantana? I see the picture of Lantana here, right below the Madre Cacao. 
it's a very powerful flight control. It's a flight deterrent. So if you put the the lantana in the northwest, on the northeast or southwest directions, because that's the direction of the wind, right? Okay. For example, oh. we're the Amihan, here. The Amihan, Amihan and Bagat. Yeah. So okay. put the lantana in a position where you want the wind to blow. Okay. You. Right? So I would put the lantana in the northeast or on the southwest. So that's where the wind blows. So that the dining room, for example, will not have flies. Oh. Very okay. interesting. You know why, Joy? In uh, mm. Sui, what they call the northeast direction and the southwest direction, the northeast uh -huh. direction is called the male devil's door. Ooh. And the uh, southwest is the female devil's door. Okay, that's so bad. that's where the bad wind comes in. So, as you said, uh, flies with who carry possibly illness with the viruses or bacteria in their bodies from the garbage that they uh, uh, eat from carry the diseases into the home. No, so if you shield it with this type of plants, you're amply protected. In the first instance, oh. <laughs> how to control anai? Okay, so Joy, uh, take yeah. us on a visual ride. Okay. Yeah, lime dust is for those. I mean, for those with um, white stone windows, you just um, wipe them with lime dust and water, and the termites won't be crawling there because they burn. They burn with the lime dust, no? Um, oh. Yeah, as a spray solution. You put minced garlic and minced chili labu chili labuyo. When I use sinamak. In, yeah, sinamak, I actually dilute that with a little bit of vinegar and lots of water and I spray that in all the wooden parts of my house when I'm cleaning. So well lime is plentiful in Cebu. They say locally we want to produce the lime, we just get oysters. As you will describe. Oysters, yeah. Talaba, yeah. Or any kind of shell. Oh, okay. Shells Don't are always them. made of oysters. Yeah, I just burn them. And, and then, uh, you have a yard. Just, uh -huh. There might will not. Because because the if you look into the microscope, the, the crystalline structure of the lime dust is so sharp that the termites mm -hmm. mga sila. Mm -hmm. oh. They don't know where lime dust is, yes. Very microscopically uh, <laughs> assassinated. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then your best so, friend is actually the chicken. Mm, the best anti termite? Anti termite because how, the how staple they eat the termite. The staple food of ter of chickens are termites. Kayanga this free range chickens. You know you notice oh. how chickens go go like this to the ground? Oh, oh. Yes. <laughs> No? So the Filipino Filipino superstition or isang kahig isang tuka, uh, <laughs> that's not true. It helps you protect your house from termites. <laughs> Bawat mm. kahig ng chicken and tuka. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so what? When I build the fence, can I put goat dung uh, underneath the footings? Build your fence, put flowers on it and on the ground fertilize it with goat dung. Ah, okay. So, create a garden na lang para mas ano, no? Deterrent, yeah. no? Okay. Mm. So, that's a simple tip there. And, but uh... Wrap the, wrap the bottom of your... Because it, you have to put it on a foundation. Don't put... Don't bury wood, no? Place it on a concrete so that, uh, that, that the wooden part is above the ground. Never embed uh -huh. in the ground. I never embed wood in the ground. It will attract no. termites. Or it will it will get rotten, no? Mm -hmm. In the okay. long term. So that ends our uh, termite pest control story here. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Ah, the Bahai Kubo. Uh, can you <laughs> share with us the wisdom of the Bahai Kubo uh, uh, heritage? Yeah, for me, the Bahai Kubo is the most perfect inspiration for how we should build homes in the Philippines you know it's a very airy house it has a front where I mean the way it's really you know um, very relevant to our lives also we don't have to build a jungle looking by Kubo but the principles behind it and I think that's what we're going to talk about in the next slide no 
Okay, let's go to the next slide then. Okay. Mm, these are examples of Bahay Kubos in the Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Though they have different, I know there's a lot of similarities here. Most of them are really on high ground. Uh -huh. So, Space flooring this, talaga. Yeah, always. Yeah. The third one, the, third, the next slide. This one. These are the lessons that we will learn from the Bahay Kubo. You okay. see, it's biophilic okay. and bioclimatic, and it's also let heritage. Me, let me ask you, uh, Joy, take off from our termite control. You said never bury wood in the ground. So the footings of uh, Bahay Kubo are wood, no? Uh, what, what could you recommend? Anti-termite. Well, I think you should make a concrete foundation and, and raise uh, it up so that the wooden part is above the ground. Okay. You know, the original Bahay Kubos were meant to be transferred. They were, they're not, if you wanted something permanent, you know, oh, for a longer time. No? Yeah. So you would want to put the proper foundation now. Mm. And then raise the wood above the ground. So even now, the modern uh, applications like... Uh, Medyo uso ngayon or trending yung container homes, no? Uh, no wonder they also elevate it. They put concrete uh, footings, no? Not directly on the ground. For reasons like the moisture and uh, the anai and other uh, uh, pest attracting uh, qualities of uh, this bad practice. Okay, you. Uh, this is what I learned from Bobby Maniosa in uh, interaction way, way back when I was still uh, oh, with Marina Properties in NDC. When we were planning uh, the townhouses in Marina Properties in Asia World, uh, they were then building the design of MRT, LRT stations. If you look at our train stations along Top Avenue, they're inspired like this, uh, Bahay Kubo inspired. For the ventilation, the drainage, uh, and the loop. No? Okay. So let's go to the next slide. Oh, these are homes. Uh, still this, subdivision. Yeah. this is one subdivision, and these were four homes in that subdivision up in the mountains. And they also wanted us to design the Bai Kubo kind of. I know. Oh. So these are your Bai Kubo interpretations. Yeah, these are ours. Yes. Oh, in that okay. subdivision. So, did you adopt anything uh, like for the windows? What's your style when you adopted? Yeah, look at the windows, they're all very big. Look at the windows there. We have yes, also. Uh -huh. And how do they open? Is it also like flapping, like a Bahay Kubo? I know the ventanillas are sliding. Are sliding. Uh, uh -huh. Others, they have this, ano, di ba? Yung parang sari sari store. The owners uh, that you described earlier. Uh, that's for the awning above. Uh -huh. no? When they open the window, it pushes up. And even in Ayala or BGC now, you can see some buildings, the glass uh, windows, sometimes they open that way. No? Uh, parang Bahay yeah. Kubo inspired. Good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. These are nice uh, designs though so for our watching audience if you want a Bahai Kubo inspired uh, home in the future uh, you know whom to call <laughs> the name is Joy Onozawa in the Philippines okay bamboo you can as long as you wet the bamboo beforehand you can even bake with bamboo you can put it in the oven it has to be soaked wet and then you put whatever you're putting there and put it in the oven it will cook well it's a good thing to use for survival if you have no ano, diba? you can use it as a plate, as a cooking utensil, everything. Bamboo is just so versatile. So I would really encourage um, everyone to use the benefits of bamboo to however they want to use it. Okay, so can we speed up the bamboo portion? Uh, fast forward <laughs> type of slide. Yes, okay. we go, go. Uh, Mike, can we go forward? So these are the applications of bamboo. I think one note lang about the bamboo, aside from the stencil strength, the natural plant you mentioned is a very good uh, uh, effluent uh, controller or filter. 
Yes, if, if you, you go water, to the... It's like a natural water treatment plant in your garden or in your yeah. property. You can treat your sewage with bamboo. In fact, um, I know that they're, they're doing this also in Belgium, no? And if you go to the Domaguete promenade, you know, the boardwalk in Domaguete, uh -huh. at the end, um, you will find toilets. You know, the toilets of the, of the boulevard? It, uh -huh. the, the structure is bamboo. However, you will see bamboo growing on the side. That oh. bamboo that's growing on the side is actually growing on a on a tank, which Chepic treats tank. the sewage from the tanks. Yeah, off the toilet. Oh. We did that with our students at the Foundation University mm -hmm. three years ago. Yes. Okay. So that's good that advice is a, for those uh, building their vacation houses in the provinces, mm -hmm. the farm. Uh, you yeah. can create your, uh, uh, let's say, resort toilet like that, uh, tourist uh, toilets, uh, beside the bamboo grove, no? surrounded by mm. bamboo grove. So, so you have a natural wastewater treatment plant. <laughs> okay. Do you know uh, what I'm suggesting that you use bamboo along the sides of the Pasig River? Because that will clean oh, the river immensely. Oh, that's what they miss, no? Uh, yes. Hopefully, uh, when they yeah. start building a skyway above Pasig River, uh, the river bank will uh, sport bamboo. The local, okay. We did a local resource mapping here. Um, this was a revitalization project where a lot of the people who lived here were already gone. They went to the main capital to work. So, it was like that. so to bring them back, we had to uh, show how people can you know the pogon bit other they were cooking in this you know, and they would be making the ting ting and uh -huh. um they had all sorts of things which for but we were able to bring them all back um as a tourist spot and an educational center so right now if you can see in the next slide um okay it's now an area to visit in in guam it's the oldest um spanish village in guam oh, is this where you and won that was, an award and, uh, US, and this is also very important for us Filipinos because this is where Pedro Calungsod was with Father oh. Burgos in this village. I see. I see. Yeah. Okay, let's see the next slide. Uh, what's this? Uh, ah, it becomes Same. a tourist destination. But now you already have this. It's evolved into something where you can have daily tours and looking at their heritage. So. You see, heritage conservation here was really a powerful tool in revitalizing the village. I always believe that if you use heritage conservation as a tool, not as an end, it becomes very, very sustainable. So the nice insight here, Joy, is uh, there could be synergy in policy programs between, let's say, mm. in the Philippines, the Tourism uh, Trust and uh, cultural, let's say, NCCA or uh, heritage developers. No? Uh, they can fuse together to create a good uh, regional enterprise developments in uh, local places. No, uh, no different from let's say other Asian countries, right? Like uh, in Bali, the coffee making. Uh, you go to this whole field trip. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Even the civet cut coffee is made. And here we, we do have some initiatives already, like in uh, Aklan, how they make barong, di ba? the juicy barong. Um, so something, uh, we have big budgets right now, uh, 4.5 trillion and large size going to tourism. But hopefully they use it well. No? Uh, I really think we go, yeah, the modern world, we've forgotten about us, no, we're always looking into what's good outside and bringing them in. So now let's start looking in, and I think this pandemic has really made us do that. We're starting to look in, and what we can do. So I suggest we path. continue. The yeah, yeah, this is the side path. of uh, pandemic. The pandemic. Hopefully, we we go beyond. Uh, uh, recently, there are also pandemic variants now, no, like the UK uh, uh, variant. It's now uh, in Benguet or Mountain Province. Uh, you know how humorous uh, us Filipinos can get. They say that if uh, uh, the variant enters Baguio, the variant will mutate anew 
and it will be called ukay ukay and that's how decadent our culture is getting uh, we have to preserve our heritage unless we want to have an ukay ukay heritage like what's developing in Baguio <laughs> diba? uh, so it's an eye opener for uh, all of us to look back where we came from heritage stay tuned for the next episode only here on big media <laughs> <laughs>